Thank you, and thank you for inviting me to this wonderful conference. I wanted to thank Michael Lang and particularly thank Nina. Nina, I love you. Thank you so much. Um, you, um, um, I didn't know the word taxpayer rights 15 years ago, and I've been around a long time, and I think you've brought it forward not only in the United States but on the, on the globe, so thank you. Um, so uh, what I want to do um, this afternoon, and by the way, um, um, I'm gonna, I've got a few pictures to show you today, and I decided to use some pictures because it's the second day of a long conference, and I think pictures uh, will be keep us all sort of more on focus than 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 words. Um, so please uh, indulge me in some maybe frivolous pictures. Um, the uh, the tax court's got about 24,000 cases pending, and so my focus today is going to be on the large majority of those cases, which are cases that are not the million-dollar case, but rather the $50,000 or less case, and those represent the majority of cases, even though they don't necessarily represent um, the majority of dollars in dispute um, in the U.S. tax court. And what I want to do today is uh, basically three prongs. I'm going to give a little bit of background, my frivolous pictures, um, and then talk about the court and talk about the court in two aspects. One, lawyering in the court and also judging in the court. So let's see if I can make this work. So um, um, a, the taxpayer attempts to complete a, um, a tax return, and we've heard a lot about taxpayers uh, trying to complete tax returns and the difficulty of it and the frustration of it. Um, so these uh, photos or pictures are not based upon an, an empirical study or any of the really good studies we've heard today, but rather my 34 years on the court and then 13 years before that as a trial lawyer before the IRS. But I know that the taxpayers I see are incredibly frustrated by um, having to prepare a return. Um, and then the next step is that a taxpayer might uh, have a return that's selected for audit. Um, and that's an interesting process as well. Um, so um, the IRS uses some interesting words which include the word adjustment omitted income. I think what the taxpayer reads is, is wrong, that they've done something wrong in their return. Um, and some of my work um, has been based upon a wonderful book that I recently read by Catherine Schultz, and the title of the book is uh, Being Wrong, Adventures in the Margin of Error. Um, and what she um, um, postulates is, and I quote from um, Ms. Schultz, our love of being right is best understood as our fear of being wrong. Um, and I think that um, this is a true statement for a lot of us. I can't think of how many times I might have said to some loved one, um, um, I told you so, um, or um, I now withhold that because it's not uh, kids don't want to hear that or loved ones don't want to hear that. But we, but we all like being right. So the taxpayer has been told that, that they're wrong. And I think, um, again, I really want to set this up to make sure that you understand what I look at when I see a taxpayer, particularly a self-represented taxpayer, come before me. They're not necessarily in a, a positive mode. So, um, so the taxpayer gets this notice, um, and the notice um, might get put in a pile on a desk, um, or it might get put in a trash can. Um, it's, you know, one of those is certainly a possibility. Um, or the taxpayer might um, actually um, try to read the notice, and we've talked um, over the last couple of days about complexity and some of the notices issued by taxing authorities. And I'm going to call on Rena to read to us um, what this says. Um, it's um, um, an expression certainly in the United States is this is Greek to me, so that's the Greek alphabet. Taxpayer tries to read a notice and there's not a chance that, that he or she can really understand what, what, what it says. Um, so um, then it's clearly that a taxpayer needs help. So uh, let's call on for help. We bring in an army of lawyers, uh, but they may be walking very fast. They might be having very, wearing very expensive suits, and they keep on going. Um, they charge a lot of money, and the taxpayer has got some empty pockets, so um, he doesn't get too far. Um, so in 1981, um, the United States Supreme Court 
um, ruled in a very important case, um, and, and that is uh, the Supreme Court, and by the way, I don't mean to uh, say bad things about the folks in this picture because they actually weren't there when this ruling came out in 1981, um, but um, the uh, United States Supreme Court said that uh, um, uh, a, an individual did not have a right to counsel in a civil case. Um, so again, um, but then 30 years later, something really interesting happened. Another case came along, and that was only five or six years ago, a case uh, called Turner v. Rogers. Um, and I wanted to just talk just for a minute about what happened in Turner v. Rogers. So Michael Turner um, spent about uh, two or three years in jail over a period of, of seven years. Um, the reason that he spent time in jail was that he was in child arrears. Um, in other words, he and his wife had gotten divorced. Uh, the court, the local court in South Carolina had ordered, and the nice thing about this, it's a non-tax case this afternoon. So the, uh, um, the, the South Carolina's court ordered uh, that he pay child pay, child support, um, in the amount of $51.73 a week. Um, and it wasn't paid, he was held in civil contempt, um, and each time he didn't pay, he was put in jail. Sometimes it was a day, the longest time he spent in jail was nine months for failure to pay the $51.73 a week. Um, the last time he was incarcerated, um, he got some help from local services, legal services organization, and sought to um, um, make uh, an argument that maybe he ought to have right to counsel. Well, so the Supreme Court considered, again, 30 years later, the same issue. Um, unfortunately, the Supreme Court, and by the way, the, the uh, uh, state of South Carolina first argued um, that the case was moot, that the Supreme Court shouldn't hear it because um, at this point, Mr. Rogers was out of jail. Um, fortunately, at least the Supreme Court said, well, wait a minute, um, you know, that's not a good reason to at least not hear this issue of whether or not he's entitled to counsel. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court um, did not uh, change their original holding um, in Lassiter from 30 years earlier, but they did say a couple of important things. Um, and they did say that the state was under a duty to provide an alternative procedure to ensure a fair determination. Um, and, and I think those words are really important. And they further said that Mr. Turner did not have fair notice, the fair notice being that ability to pay was a critical question in the proceeding of whether or not he should be charged with civil contempt. So the Supreme Court then further opined and said, here's what ought to happen. Um, the, 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 the state should at least provide some forms um, designated to elicit information from the individual. Secondly, that he ought to have an opportunity to respond. And then thirdly, that it was a duty of the court to make findings with respect to ability to pay. Um, so these are really important holding um, from the viewpoint of American justice because it's something that we could carry over, I think, into the, the civil context. Um, so it didn't answer all of the questions, but it surely helped some. So without the right to counsel, of course, the leaves the taxpayer with few options. Um, we heard yesterday about um, uh, the, the concept of that, um, that a judge um, in, in pretty much our U.S. courts, uh, the job is to call balls and strikes, or as further described, uh, red cards, yellow cards, um, and that is, that's what they're supposed to do. Um, but Few lay people lacking a legal education get a really fair day in court. I just like this picture. I included it. So if, I don't know if you can read the words on top, but it's um, the plains of America covered by a vast herd of lawyers. I just put it in there because I thought it was uh, appropriate for late in the afternoon. Um, so we've got a lot of lawyers. Um, and yet taxpayers seem to be unrepresented and my question to you is of course how could that be and the statistics are that 90 percent of the lawyers serve 10 percent of the population so even though we've got a lot of lawyers we don't necessarily have the representation where we need it um, according to the world justice project the united states uh, ranks 67th um, 
which is tied with Uganda of 97 countries providing access to justice and afford affordability of legal services. Um, one of my favorite um, photos, and we're getting close to the end of my photos here, is, is this 1931 um, photo, and I'm not sure if you can read it, what it says is um, justice taken for a ride. So it was 1931, um, Lady Liberty has got a blindfold on her, she's being put in, a, in, a, in the back seat of a car with a bunch of gangsters um, out of Chicago. So, um, so, the, so the litigant comes into court, um, more than 70% of our litigants in the tax court um, come without legal representation, and of course uh, the taxpayer who now becomes a petitioner in the tax court says, um, what, what do I say, what do I do? So the tax court's made a number of attempts um, to try to balance the scales of justice, and I'm very proud of the, some of the things that we've done. Um, Andre talked earlier about, um, about law school program, and we've got a lot of clinical programs, and clinical programs in the United States get funded through the taxpayer National Taxpayer Advocate um, with matching funds. Um, there are a number of justice commissions throughout the United States which have really worked hard at, at finding uh, civil access to justice on a number of fronts. Um, and, and I'd like to think that the United States Tax Court is reasonably user-friendly, and that is with a website describing to taxpayers exactly what they ne need to do. Um, but that doesn't answer all of the questions, and, and this is where I sort of moved from the, 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 the basic question of the taxpayer to the, from the lawyers and now to the court itself. And, and so the question that I pose is, should we perpetuate the adversary image of, of civil justice? Um, and this was not necessarily my idea. I talked um, just in the past few weeks to Professor Jessica Steinberg at GW, who's written a wonderful paper, as well as some other scholars about the, the, the adversary system and how well it does not work for uh, pro se or self-represented litigants as much as we try to, to make it work. So assuming that the uh, statistics remain as they are, that, that we'll have this large population of unrepresented litigants, um, we need to look at whether or not judges um, should currently um, have a wide latitude in departing from what's known as the passive norm. Again, the passive norm being that the judge um, calls balls and strikes. Um, the theory of the passive norm, of course, is that it permits the judge to remain neutral. I've got to catch up here. Um, and this theory has been challenged, whether or not a, a judge could still be neutral and do something more. So some courts um, have supported the notion that courts should provide pro se parties with a meaningful opportunity to present their case. Um, and the question is, well, it will impartiality um, or will there be, is there, there a fear of loss of impartiality by the judge um, getting more involved in the case, as Andre suggested, the judge directing the lawyer, giving the lawyer a cue about here's the question you want to ask, um, and, um, and then the lawyer going ahead and ask, asking it. In fact, the Code of Judicial Conduct um, permits judges to make reasonable accommodations to ensure pro se litigants that they have the opportunity um, to have their matter fairly heard. The problem, of course, is what is a reasonable accommodation? Um, and what, what I think most of us talk about is that re a reasonable accommodation is based very much upon judicial discretion. And of course, the problem with judicial discretion is that, uh, that it doesn't really provide us much of a standard. It invites implicit bias. Um, it makes review by an appellate court incredibly difficult. So, what, what Professor Steinberg suggests is that there ought to be a, a requirement of affirmative judging. And she suggests that the judge should assist the pro se litigant um, in cultivating legal theory, in eliciting relevant facts, and granting appropriate remedies. 
sort of sticks in my throat a bit, um, but that's what she suggests. Um, and when I take a step back from it, though, I really think to myself, well, wait a minute. Um, let's look at what judges do in complex cases. Um, in a complex case, a judge gets very much involved in pretrial, is on the phone with the parties, um, doing, uh, dealing with discovery matters, um, communication matters between the parties. So um, certainly the judge is, is, is doing something more than calling balls and strikes. So why not um, um, assisting during the trial or taking a more affirmative role during the trial? Um, ideally, what we would hope that um, at some point that every opinion might read from the tax court would never have the words taxpayer failed in his burden of proof or failed in her burden of proof. Uh, wouldn't that be an ideal um, that we didn't um, need to, to think that, um, that a record could have been made that wasn't made um, because um, the taxpayer didn't have the wherewithal to put the facts in um, to make those findings. I would be very happy and satisfied um, if, if that were the case. Um, so um, I guess what I wanted to just say is what would, um, what would it look like? Andre, I'm going to take about two or three more minutes. Is that good? Oh, yeah. OK. All right. So what might it look like um, if, um, if a judge were taking an active role? So let me um, I'll kind of tell you about a case that I had uh, a couple years ago where um, I probably did more than I might normally do. Um, so it was a cancellation of indebtedness case. Uh, we call them COD cases um, in the United States. Um, the IRS determined the taxpayer, we'll call him Mr. Smith, received $22,000 in cancellation of debt income in 2009. The basis for the deficiency was that the IRS received a Form 1099, um, meaning this is what the employer, uh, or I should say the financial institution issued. Um, it was from a major New York bank. And the, um, the Form 1099 had Mr. Smith's Social Security number on it. Um, Mr. Smith, of course, did not report the $22,000 in income. The IRS said a tax was due with penalties and interest as a result of Mr. Smith um, having been relieved by a debt by the bank in the United States. That's a source of income and, pro and properly reportable. So Mr. Sm Smith came to court representing himself, and he testified that he never signed for a loan with a bank um, and was totally um, um, unfamiliar with, uh, with the circumstances of a bank loan. Um, of course, if that were the case, he couldn't be relieved of a debt. He wouldn't be responsible for omitted income. Um, towards the end of the trial, um, and by the way, the IRS didn't do very much at that trial. They just simply presented the Form 1099, said must, must be income. Um, of course, when the bank issued that 1099, um, on the deduction side, the bank gets to write that off as a deduction. So they very quickly will issue those, those forms so that they can deduct the, the, uh, the, the loss. Um, at some point, um, at near the end of the trial, uh, Mr. Smith made a sort of an amazing statement. And what he said was, he said, gee, I don't understand what's going on here. He says, but I issued a subpoena to the bank three weeks ago. And then I called them a dozen times, and I kept getting voicemails. Couldn't reach anybody. Um, and there's nobody here today. Um, this was the first that I heard that, that he had issued a subpoena. Um, so the best that he could do was to just provide his own testimony with no other evidence. Now, I, I guess passive judging the judge might sit back and say, OK, well, I've heard some evidence here. I might believe the taxpayer that never, tax, taxpayer never took out a loan. The government really didn't present much. Um, but it was far from you know, a sure case, um, probably, um, and if, especially if it was taxpayer's burden of proof, which it is. Taxpayer didn't prove that the determination made by the IRS was erroneous. Um, so um, the passive judge might have just sat back, taken the case back home, read it better, and then done that stock paragraph burden of proof. So what might the active judge do? Active judge might say, subpoena, hmm, where, where is the bank people? I don't see them in the courtroom. Um, 
And um, so what I did in that case, um, I was really disturbed that the taxpayer had actually done everything right, except for he didn't know and didn't understand what the next step was. The next step, as a lawyer would know, is I need to do something to enforce a subpoena, maybe file something in advance of trial, or certainly at the beginning of trial, say, Judge, I've issued a subpoena. The subpoenaed party's not here. Could you please enforce the subpoena? And I would have happily done that. Um, so. I called the parties into chambers and I said to Mr. Smith, let me see the copy of the subpoena. He showed it to me because this is the, the first time I've seen it. And I said, well, where's the bank? Well, Chase Manhattan Bank, I'm making that up. I don't mean to disparage Chase. I have a mortgage with Chase Manhattan Bank. Um, and um, so I had, again, IRS counsel and taxpayer in chambers, and we got on the speakerphone and I started pushing buttons on the phone. 30 minutes later, we finally got through to the legal department um, of the bank. Um, about 10 minutes later, we found the lawyer whose desk the subpoena was on. And I, in my, I'm, I'm, I don't speak harshly often, but this was one of those times I said, sir, what, what were you planning to do with a subpoena you do in court today? Um, Mr. Smith is here. Um, and they said, oh, well, we're sorry we didn't get to this. We have a pile on the desk, the same pile that the taxpayer picture you saw earlier had on the desk, I'm sure. Um, and um, so let's, um, um, could we, uh, we can get this to you next week. And I said, no, that's not going to work. Um, for, for those of you who don't know, the way the U.S. tax court works is that tax court judges travel around the United States, generally go to a city for a few days or a week. So I was not about to sit around for the following week um, at, at government expense um, and suggested that somebody from the bank show up the next morning with the, with the bank documents. Um, and sure enough, they showed up uh, the next morning with the bank documents, um, produced a loan agreement, um, which had Mr. Smith's name on it and Mrs. Smith's name on it, and only the signature of Mrs. Smith. Um, and it turned out that she had taken the loan out, um, not him, but the bank had his name on it and his social security number. He got hit with a 1099. At that point, the government said, we'll concede. I said, oh, that's very generous of you. I'm glad that you'll concede. And, um, and everyone went home. So I think that was active judging. I wish I could say that all the time we're that successful. Um, but I think um, what I'd like to do, you know, over the course of the next, um, you know, months and years of my remaining years on the bench is to convince um, many of my other colleagues, and I must say I'm not the only one. I think there are a number of judges who think active judging, um, affirmative judging is really important and necessary, and it doesn't, um, you know, impair impartiality. Um, and that, I think that's what we need to do, um, in addition to all of the other help that we get from the pro bono lawyers and from the tax clinics. So I think that's pretty much my presentation. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, now for Christine's conference, uh, her, she'll talk with the, about the Altera case. Um, and she'll tell us a story about the IRS um, that did not provide adequate explanation in drafting a new regulation. And in my readings on the subject, um, it, a, an expert was saying that this decision might open up an entirely new avenue to litigate regulations written by the IRS, where the agency has not provided an adequate explanation of the uh, of its uh, rulemaking. So uh, Christine will deal with administrative law and tax law together. I just want to lower this. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Sorry, a little technical difficulty. I wanted this lowered because I'm a little shorter and, uh, you know, peering over, you know, seeing my eyes over the top of it just wouldn't get, wasn't going to work. Anyway, I'm so delighted to be here. I want to thank Nina as well for uh, including me in this conference, Michael, for hosting such a wonderful conference, and just say how honored I am to be on this panel. Um, tax administration in the United States is in the midst of a period of change, at least as regards to a certain corner of tax administration, that I consider to be really favorable to taxpayer rights, uh, and that is being driven by our judiciary. Our tax administrators at the Treasury Department and the Internal Revenue Service have a tremendous amount of discretion 
in defining the requirements of our tax laws. Sure, Congress enacts the statute, but there are lots of ambiguities and holes in the statute, and our Treasury and IRS have a lot of discretionary power in filling in those statutory gaps. Our tax authorities aren't unique in this regard for the U.S. system of government, whether the area of law is tax or environmental law or food and drug, or health care, or financial regulation, whatever it might be, government administrators in our executive branch have a lot of discretion in elaborating statutory terms. And judicial review of administrative action is available, but tends to be quite deferential to the exercise of discretionary power on behalf of agencies, especially in tax cases. We can debate why that might be a lot of speculation just has to, happens to be that tax is complicated and judges are influenced by that complexity as well. Um, so for other areas of law in the United States, government agency exercises of discretionary power have for several decades been constrained by our Administrative Procedure Act. That statute imposes on government agencies a variety of procedural and process requirements aimed at ensuring transparency and accountability for agency decision making. And our courts take these procedural and process requirements quite seriously and will not hesitate to invalidate an agency action that fails to satisfy those procedural and process requirements. The IRS and the Internal Revenue Manual for many years acknowledged the existence of the Administrative Procedure Act and sort of nodded, yes, yes, we're covered by this, but generally, nevertheless, considered tax administration for various reasons to be exempt from the procedural and process requirements imposed on other agency regulatory efforts. The IRS claimed to follow the Administrative Procedure Act requirements anyway on a voluntary basis. Meanwhile, legal academics and other tax commenters have observed for some time that IRS compliance with Administrative Procedure Act requirements was a little bit loosey-goosey, if you'll forgive the colloquial term, subpar or sub suboptimal in many ways. All of this came to the fore in 2011 uh, with a case called Mayo Foundation. Now in that case, the issue that was in front of our Supreme Court was what the standard of judicial review ought to be when the IRS adopts a binding regulation interpreting the tax laws in a particular way. Here we had a regulation concluding, for example, that medical residents are employees who are subject to payroll taxes. Taxation. It wasn't clear from the statute whether they were employees or not, and we had a regulation that said that they were. And the Supreme Court held it, uh, that the relevant standard of judicial review uh, of that regulation was the same standard that applies to every other government agency, rather than a standard that is unique to, for tax cases. In other words, they repudiated tax exceptionalism with respect to the standard of review that would apply to tax. But the court also used more sweeping rhetoric that courts and commentators have interpreted more broadly as requiring tax administration to comply with the requirements of the Administrative Procedure Act unless tax administrators can convince the courts that Congress in the Internal Revenue Code has specifically exempted the IRS from a particular Administrative Procedure Act requirement. Well, the consequence of this is we now have several separate strands of jurisprudence emerging, exploring the parameters of that sweeping rhetoric from the Mayo Foundation case, uh, and exploring the relationship between the Administrative Procedure Act and tax administration with respect to particular procedural and process requirements. Um, there's a line of cases concerning whether Treasury regulations should be subject to judicial review on a pre-enforcement basis, or whether taxpayers have to wait until they are the subject of a refund or deficiency action to challenge the validity of a Treasury regulation or IRS guidance document. There's another line of cases addressing whether and to what extent the IRS needs to explain its reasoning in issuing a notice of deficiency. There's a third line of cases that that I'll talk about in just a minute, stemming from Altera, 
uh, that concerns the extent to which the IRS must explain its reasoning in issuing a Treasury regulation. All of these lines of jurisprudence push toward greater transparency and accountability on the part of tax administrators as they exercise discretionary power in administering and implementing the tax laws. Uh, the paper that I've been writing in conjunction with this conference, uh, which will be published in the Journal of Tax Administration sometime in the next couple of months, describes three different strands of these, this jurisprudence that I'm talking about. In the time that I have left, though, I'm just going to briefly describe one of those strands uh, just to exemplify uh, this phenomenon. So the Administrative Procedure Act calls upon reviewing courts to set aside agency action that's found to be arbitrary, capricious, and abuse of discretion or otherwise contrary to law. That's the statutory language. It's kind of a mouthful. We call it the arbitrary and capricious standard. In a case three decades ago called State Farm, uh, the Supreme Court interpreted the arbitrary and capricious standard to require administering agencies to provide contemporaneous explanations justifying their exercises of discretionary power. So, for example, when the IRS adopts a binding regulation elaborating the requirements of the tax laws, if the arbitrary and capricious standard applies, then it would require the IRS not only to explain how its regulations would operate, but also why the IRS is making the regulatory choices it is making as it exercises discretion in adopting those regulations. So the way I explain arbitrary and capricious to my student is I say, well, maybe the statute is flexible enough to allow the agency to adopt approach A, reasonable approach A, or reasonable approach B. The agency can't make that choice, though, by throwing a dart at a dartboard. The agency has to explain in choosing between A and B why it thinks A is the better choice, not just how A operates. Um, you know, so in any event, uh, for decades, the Internal Revenue Manual, on the contrary, instructed IRS regulation drafters the exact opposite, telling them that the preambles to their regulations did not need to justify or explain their choices in the sense of why they were making the choices they were making. All they, their regulation preambles had to offer is how the regulations work. And frankly, IRS regulatory preambles have been relatively sparse in recent decades, sometimes ignoring or glossing over legitimate objections or concerns raised by taxpayers in the rulemaking process about the content of their regulations. So in a post-Mayo case called Altera, decided about a year and a half ago, the United States Tax Court unanimously declared that State Farm and the arbitrary and capricious standard apply to tax regulations and that the IRS must contemporaneously with the adoption of their regulations explain their regulatory choices, including addressing legitimate issues and concerns raised by taxpayers in the rulemaking process. And the tax court invalidated the particular set of regulations being challenged for the IRS's failure to satisfy that requirement. And one of the reasons that Altera, in my mind, was particularly significant was because it was unanimous. The entire tax court, all 16 judges, I believe, you know, basically agreed with this reasoning. I've been in tax practice for 25 years, and I think this is the first time I've ever seen invalidation of a treasury regulation by the tax court unanimously. Um, maybe I'm wrong, but I, you know, it's not customary that usually you've got multiple opinions and disagreements and things like that, unanimous. Um, so now, Altera is currently under appeal to our Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. We'll see what happens out of that. Um, I, for one, think that it's likely that the Ninth Circuit will uphold the tax court, but irrespective of what happens on appeal in Altera, we now have other cases following Altera's lead, challenging other regulations on similar grounds for the IRS's failure to satisfy the State Farm interpretation of the arbitrary and capricious standard. And the IRS has responded to this litigation by expanding the explanations of their regulations in their regulatory preambles.
in at least three very high profile and controversial rulemakings in the past year where Treasury has adopted uh, fairly extensive regulations that have been somewhat controversial, the IRS has, has issued much more extensive regulatory preambles that have obviously been written to satisfy the arbitrary and capricious standard as interpreted in the State Farm case and applied in the tax context by the tax court in Altera. So in short, the line of ca cases that Altera represents shows our judiciary in our post-Mayo Foundation world driving IRS administrative practices toward greater transparency and accountability in the exercise of discretionary power. This is huge in my eyes. We've had a lot of discussion over the past two days about the importance of transparency and accountability for perceptions of legitimacy of the tax system and thus in turn for taxpayer compliance. In my view, this trend being driven by our judiciary serves taxpayer rights and taxpayer interests and embrace enhances the legitimacy of the tax system and thus will improve our tax system in the long run. Um, and with that, I think I'll sit down. Our third speaker is Diana Bernal, as I mentioned, the uh, ombudsman in, in Mexico. And she'll be talking about special procedure put together, special mechanism of protection put together in Mexico uh, to give taxpayer a better protection against the uh, tax administration. to deliver my presentation here, but I want to say to you good afternoon, and it's an honor to be here in this afternoon. I would like to begin my presentation by mentioning that for me it seems essential to look for new models of um, to give taxpayers a new and better and fair tax justice. Uh, an important feature of tax law in the new millennium is the need to develop a renew and enhance relationship between taxpayer and tax administration. We can actually realize that traditional procedures to achieve tax justice are now demanding new patterns. It is very relevant that people can achieve real tax justice, fundamentally based in the substance of the tax conflict. In other words, to solve the controversy raised between tax authority and taxpayers, considering the facts that effectively occurred. I strongly believe that eventually, the legal formalism in the resolution of tax problems should be overcome. In this background, the role of the new specialized taxpayer's advocate or taxpayer ombudsman acquires then a particular relevance in order to accomplish such objectives. Well, in this talk, I am going to share with you the Mexican experience in finding and developing such new patterns to achieve real, fair, accessible, and effective tax justice. The Mexican taxpayer Sombusman, named Procuraduría de la Defensa del Contribuyente in Spanish, PRODECON, has an experience of more than five years. And nowadays, we have served more than 300,000 taxpayers. Actually, one of the main roles that can be performed by a tax Sombusman is to bring the most prompt and effective solution to tax conflicts. As a matter of fact, PRODECON has introduced innovative and fresh procedures defined by its easy access for every taxpayer. Indeed, the developed procedures by PRODECON appear friendlier with less, less cost and less stress to taxpayers. PRODECON has been invested by the law with very important faculties. Nevertheless, it is important to emphasize 
that we do not have the supremacy of an authority. We do not have official dom because as an ombudsman, we are actually the true representative of taxpayers. In such manner, our Mexican tax ombudsman, PRODECON, thanks to its legal faculties, can really act as an effective intermediary between the two parties involved in the tax legal relationship. Therefore, we are able to timely reach efficient, fast, and true remedies for taxpayers' problems. Additionally, taxpayers can complain before PRODECON for any kind of tax authority action, since plain informal taxpayers' invitations from Mexican Tax Administration, SAT, to present some tax returns to authentic tax liabilities. Actually, taxpayers can come to PRODECON when they feel affected for any kind of tax authorities acts, even those that could usually not be challenged before courts. Nowadays, PRODECON has 10 important faculties to reach its objectives on behalf of taxpayers. In this brief presentation, I am going to focus on the two main faculties PRODECON has, the complaint procedure, excuse me, excuse me. In this brief presentation, I am going to focus on the two main faculties PRODECON has, the complaint procedure and the conclusive agreement procedure. I would like to expose how these particular procedures show in a clear way the relevance of new patterns to protect taxpayers' rights. Although each procedure has its particular features, both, both share the following. They are widely accessible. They are widely accessible. Every individual or corporation, no matter its residence or nationality, can adopt such procedures. In the same way, the amount of the tax assessment or the relevance of the tax problem is not significant. Through these two procedures, PRODECON can serve all kinds of taxpayers, whether they are a small ta taxpayer or truly multinational enterprises. The two procedures are flexible and can help taxpayers to prevent going to courts. Both complaint and conclusive agreement procedures can be seen as alternative means to timely solve tasks tax disputes. The cost they represent for taxpayers is considerably low. Private professional counseling is not a requirement to access these procedures. Tax authorities have progressively acquired confidence in the suggestions or proposals that PRODECON can make due to its character of public and official intermediary. I have to point this to, <laughs> excuse me. Another relevant aspect is that both complaint and conclusive agreement procedures aim for fairer justice by placing the substance of the case over the legal or formal truth. It is also very important to remark that the effectiveness of the complaint and conclusive agreement procedures is basically sustained in the same nature of the ombudsman. That is because such kind of autonomous organism essentially seeks to solve the taxpayers' problems considering the factual truth over the strict legal truth. In other words, the substance becomes more relevant than the legal formalism. As we can see in the following criterion, you can see it in your screen, of PRODECON, which is published in our website. La Procuraduría de la Defensa del Contribuyente, as a defender of taxpayer rights, Ombudsman, will search not only for the legal, but for the factual truth 
in order to achieve an effective defense of such rights. Thus, the easy access to the complaint procedure The easy access to the complaint procedure and its lack of formalities allow taxpayers to find practical solutions. The complaint procedure will be appreciated as a public alternative mean to solve conflicts with tax administration, rather than an instrument to develop or endorse a tax dispute. The main objective of the complaint procedure is to find the best possible solution to the disagreement between both parties and to avoid further and more complicated litigation. Additionally, the solution is reached in a very transparent and institutional way. The taxpayer, Sombusman, actually advocates to find solutions which will be convenient not only for the taxpayer but also for the tax authority. The objective is to progressively build a new and as OECD proclaims enhanced relationship among such parties. The complaint procedure is regulated. No, excuse me. This will be for Excuse me, the complaint procedure is regulated in only seven articles of PRODECON's organic law. It is a speedy procedure. When PRODECON receives the taxpayer complaint, it almost immediately issues the official requirement to the responsibility, responsibility tax authority, which is compelled to respond with 72 hours. Tax authorities must answer such requirements with clarity, and they have to expose and justify the reasons of the actions which have generated the complaint, as well as the legal and specific basis for them. I am going now to present a relevant case solved by PRODECON through the complaint procedure. A taxpayer received a note from the tax Mexican administration sat, inviting him to pay some income tax he supposedly owed since 2014 because of some cash deposits in his bank account. The taxpayer, however, expressed that he did not have any bank account in that year. In the complaint procedure, the tax authorities informed PRODECON that a financial institution reported the deposits. Therefore, PRODECON helped the taxpayer to clarify the situation, and finally, the involved bank institution issued a letter acknowledging that the reported deposits did not actually correspond with the federal tax number registration of the complainer taxpayer, but belonged to a homonymous person. In such way, the taxpayer acquired full legal certainty about his tax status. Well, I have finished with the complaint procedure, and now allow me to refer the key issues of the conclusive agreement procedure. It is easy to figure out that one of the most vulnerable moments for all taxpayers is when they are put under the scrutiny of a tax audit. The tax audit procedures also represent several financial and non-financial costs for the taxpayers, as they have to keep their whole accounts and documents available for tax auditors, and of course, attend and fulfill any sort of documentation requirements. In this background, the new procedure was established in Mexico law since 2014, when it was incorporated into the federal tax code, introducing the first alternative dispute resolution procedure during tax audits in Mexico. This domestic uh, ADRP is a mediation entrusted to a third independent party represented by PRODECON, which may intervene in tax controversies that may appear between the tax authorities and taxpayers as a result of an audit. 
while the core of the mediation is given by the qualification or assessment which the tax authority makes over the facts or omissions detected during an audit and can involve aspects related to the interpretation of law as well as to the assessment of taxpayers' evidence. In the case that the parties reach consensus, the conclusive agreement because the, becomes the vehicle to end the audit with legal certainty. It is important to mention that as well as the new procedure is totally optional for the taxpayers, nevertheless, it becomes mandatory for the reviewing tax authority, which has been called to the mediation procedure before PRODECON. But as in any other alternative mean to resolve disputes, it is optional for the tax authority to accept or refuse the terms of the taxpayer's proposal to settle the conclusive agreement. But in any case, tax authorities have to provide enough reasons to be able to refuse the agreement proposed by the taxpayer. In such way, the design of the new alternative dispute resolution procedure allows that in an accessible and transparent environment, the taxpayer may correct his tax situation totally or partially, if he decided so. More interesting is that tax authorities can change the original position or criteria regarding the tax situation of the taxpayer in an easier and more confident way. I would like to remark that the petitioners of this new procedure are mainly corporations, including multinational enterprises, which have an important operation in our country, in Mexico. To finalize my presentation on conclusive agreements, I am going to refer briefly a relevant case. A subsidiary corporation resident in Mexico, related party of a multinational enterprise, paid royalties to such related party with that, without complying in a precise manner with the arms length principle. Due to the flexibility of the conclusive agreement procedure, the Mexican taxpayer and the tax authority agree, agreed to rename the royalties as dividends for tax purposes in accordance with the OECD transfer pricing guidelines. Nevertheless, the, rename, the renaming settled in the agreement did not involve the payment of any additional amount of tax because the parties jointly decided to take the dividends from the net tax profit account of the corporation. As a result of the agreement, the MNE corrected its tax situation in Mexico and acquired legal certainty because the conclusive agreement cannot be challenged before any court. As a conclusion of my presentation, I would like to highlight that according to Mexican experience, the role that can be performed by the taxpayer's ombudsman has great relevance and implies a practical and effective way to assure safeguards and protections to enhance taxpayers' trust and improve in a real manner the perception of procedural justice. Also, the ombudsman acts as an important agent of transparency and accountability as a permanent, permanent monitor body of the authorities' acts. PRODECON works on a daily basis in recovering taxpayers' trust on the tax system, granting taxpayers several safeguards to foster their understanding of their rights and obligations. But there is indeed a key aspect for the success in the, in the improvement of the relationship between tax administration and taxpayers. PRODECON's close, right, balanced relationship with Mexican tax administration in order to reach better solutions for taxpayers' problems. We are proud that in Mexico, 
We are proud that in Mexico, well, uh, tax administration has acquired confidence in the work of Prodecon, and we have built an important bridge that allows us to reach better compliance of both parties towards a better and more fair tax system. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Diana. Uh, now, there may be questions from the floor. Or, yes, the microphone right there. Okay, uh, thank you very much for an interesting presentation. And uh, my question would be about um, combining individual case and uh, the taxpayer right to equal treatment. Uh, and the question would be, can uh, a taxpayer's right to equal treatment be exercised in the individual procedure? Why it is a question? Uh, because, uh, just imagine, a uh, taxpayer wants to challenge tax authority decision on the grounds of equal treatment, but uh, this uh, inevitably uh, involves uh, examination of uh, tax authorities' uh, treatment of third parties in this case. And uh, of course, third parties are not willing uh, that uh, their uh, information about them and uh, their transactions uh, would be revealed in this case. But uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, there is the right, uh, right uh, of taxpayers or equal treatment. And do you think it's uh, feasible and uh, could uh, taxpayers' right to equal treatment be effectively exercised in the individual case? I understand that, that may be uh, more relevant to ombudsman institutions to exercise such kind of rights, uh, providing and uh, conveying so-called systemic approach and systemic investigations. But do you think it's uh, possible to uh, exercise in individual case? Or maybe you have in your practice such kind of cases? Can, can, can you? Uh, I, I understood you talk so about third parties, but I didn't understand the interplay of the third party of the question. Oh, okay. Thank you, Nina. Let me, let me, uh, uh, from the court, now that I fully understand the question, from the court's viewpoint, certainly if a litigant comes in and says, my neighbor or I know this whole group, you, you know that that's not going to be particularly helpful. It's concerning, but not helpful in terms of, uh, and the failure of the tax administrator to examine a particular return or group. Um, I think yesterday someone mentioned some of the waiter cases. I, when I was in my years as a trial lawyer in Boston, um, we, um, I tried a number of cases for a tip income against waiters, and um, some got chosen, others didn't. Some restaurants got chosen, others didn't. That's just sort of a luck of the draw, so a different issue. Thank you. 
just wait for the microphone, please, so we can hear you. My point would be not uh, about selection for, for control procedures, but might be that uh, to say uh, other third parties, uh, other taxpayers have already been chosen for, to say, uh, control procedures audited, but the final decisions of uh, tax authorities was different, to say, to my decision. And uh, of course, I do, the, another problem is because I can't know about it because uh, uh, it's uh, not uh, accessible for me, that information, the first problem, but I only can suspect. Yes, and there, there's this, whole, just as the case that I talked about, there's this whole world of settled cases that, that, that most of the world doesn't get to see, um, and how those cases got resolved, whether at the examination level, at appeals levels, or right on the courthouse steps, or even after trial, the world does not get to see how those cases got resolved. One could, in the U.S. at least, go into records and start comparing the, the notices that got issued by the Internal Revenue Service and then the, the ultimate deficiencies that got determined uh, by the court, whether by settlement or uh, usually by settlement or agreement. But that would take a lot of research to sort of sort that out. Yeah, I don't ombudsman, but in my offices, we have actually had cases where um, a taxpayer has come in and we've gotten a resolution with a legal opinion on, on one set of facts and another taxpayer will come in and another part of my organization, because we're throughout the United States, they go to another lawyer in the IRS to get a legal opinion and they get a, it's the same set of facts and they get a completely different set of facts. And what we do there is we work those two legal opinions and we raise them up through the organization so both taxpayers are create, created, treated, you know, the same. And the taxpayer would never know that, but because they came in, at least we've been able to see that. So that is a vehicle for the individual, but it's, it's rare, you know, to find that the, both taxpayers are in our organization, you know, that's the problem. What, what is the Mexican approach? I would like to comment that for me it is very important the role of the Ombudsman in order to assure equal treatment to every taxpayer because probably a taxpayer could not uh, realize the special treatment that tax authority gives to him in some special tax conflict. But I think that the relevant role of the Ombudsman is to assure equal treatment of every, every taxpayer involved in similar situations. Any other question? Yes, in the back there. Hi, I'm William from Singapore. Um, I'd just like to um, ask uh, in relation to Judge Panuthos's um, presentation on the imbalance in terms of legal knowledge uh, uh, in, on taxpayers and the perceived disadvantage they have when they go to the litigation process. Um, can this concern be ameliorated by mediation and what do you see as the role of mediation, um, which we can see there's a growing movement towards um, alternative dispute resolutions, the PRODICON, um, it's already codified in the Mexican tax code. Um, but my question really is, do we see mediation as really offering a solution, bearing in mind that tax cases are often very complex and technical in nature, and uh, we do need to ensure that our tax cases are also grounded on principles um, to develop the tax jurisprudence. So I'd just like to know the panel's view on the role of mediation. Mm -hmm. So um, the tax court um, does have a, a process of mediation and we have a rule on mediation. Uh, what we just don't see that many cases that where parties come forward and, and choose mediation. Um, and there is, so there is a procedure for it. It's not particularly onerous. Um, the parties can come forward and ask for it. Um, we will often assign a separate judge other than the, the trial judge. Um, I'm one of the certified mediators, mediators on, the, on the court, so I've mediated a number of cases. But you have to keep in mind that in the United States at least, the 
tax system has a number of steps, including this appeals office, and appeals has a whole regimen of mediation as well, as well as the purpose of the appeals office is to try to settle cases. So statistically, they settle most of the cases before they come um, or before they are for a trial date in any event. Um, but there is a process, and it works very well. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Does it? OK. I, I would like to make a comment about the Mexican experience because, as I said, in the Mexican experience, the important issue is the mediation takes place during the audit procedure. Um, and in this uh, audit procedure, you know that um, often only are two parties, uh, frequently are two parties, tax authority and taxpayer audited. But PRODECON can intervene as a middleman, as a third party, in order to hear both, both parties, in order to try to the parties reach an agreement. And we also can, um, can make uh, meetings with tax authorities and taxpayers. And in our experience, this is a very important, very important procedure because, as, as I said, 40 per, the main demanders, com, petitioners of conclusive agreements are corporations. And in Mexico, the relevant experience is that BEPS could, uh, can be seen as an opportunity for the multinational enterprises in order to change the, your way to pay tax, taxes in some, in some country. And if these multinational enterprises, as an example, ha have this kind of mediation, it's the perfect opportunity in order to solve the, your differences uh, before the tax liability is imposed. And when they subscribe the conclusive agreement in face of PRODECON, they acquire legal certainty because the conclusive agreement cannot be challenged in, in, in any Mexican or international court, I guess. Yes. Just wait a second, please. Uh, I have a question for, for Christine. What's your final balance um, regarding that the judiciary branch has the last word and the decision in order to influence a tax change in the tax administration? Don't you see that it's dangerous that as a consequence of a key court case, the tax system could be changed without uh, taking into consideration a lot of uh, spe special features that taxpayers could be in that specific treatment? Um, I think the, the, the thing that I didn't talk about but that is probably relevant, at least when we're talking about something like the arbitrary and capricious standard, like I was talking about in Altera, is that the remedy if Treasury has acted arbitrarily is not just taxpayer wins and doesn't have to pay taxes or the regulation is forever invalid the remedy is remand to the agency to go back and do it again and do it right the second time um, at least hopefully you know offer more explanation uh, address the concerns that were raised um, so it's not that uh, the, the the ultimately there isn't so long as the regulation that's adopted is consistent substantively with the interpretation of the of the tax laws it's not as though treasury can never adopt that policy but it, when it does so it needs to do so demonstrating to the reviewing court hey we've taken the objections that were raised seriously we've considered the evidence the counter evidence that has been put in front of us by by taxpayers uh, we've addressed their concerns or at least we've acknowledged their concerns and this is how we've done it um, and if Treasury doesn't do that, then we don't know whether Treasury has adopted its policy by throwing a dart at a dartboard or by actually using reasoned decision making. Um, so to the extent that that's the remedy, remand back to the agency to do it again, I'm not tremendously troubled. One of the things we've seen in other areas of the law where this standard has been applied is that agencies learn 
over time or have learned over time. You know, they have a few regulations invalidated on these sorts of grounds, and they get much better at explaining how they do things. And so then in the future, it's actually something that most regulations across our government have no problem complying with because agencies have learned what they need to do to satisfy the courts and to be transparent in this sort of a way with the consequence that more of the regulations are upheld. Treasury's just a little bit behind the curve on this one. Um, and I'm, I'm confident. I mean, you know, I, I get accused all the time of beating up on the IRS and Treasury with the work that I do. And the fact of the matter is I don't think of myself that way. I think of myself as improving the tax system for everyone. You know, but the fact of the matter is I think that the people who are drafting regulations by and large are trying to make the best decisions that they can and are engaging for the most part in reasoned decision making. They just haven't gotten into the habit of proving it to everybody else. And so that's why it doesn't bother me too much. There is a little bit of that concern, um, but we've been employing, you know, State Farm's been around for 30 years, uh, and the Republic hasn't fallen yet. Uh, so I, 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 I tend to think that the courts and the agencies across the administrative state have managed to balance things fairly well. Any other question? Uh, maybe I have a question for you, Christine. So how, how, how come the, the tax people, when they draft uh, regulations, have forgotten the, that there is an administrative law that has to be obeyed by this? So why, <laughs> what, what is the cause of that? Well, that's a good question because nobody knows precisely. Um, you know, I, I did some research several years ago that at least tracked j judicial review in tax cases and a little, not every single issue, but a lot of this stuff that showed fairly parallel uh, treatment of other agencies, you know, that the, the tax and administrative law generally followed the same path up until around the 1970s, at which point then you started to see administrative law veer off one direction and tax kind of veer off a different direction. Um, and somewhere in there was when the tax regulation drafters or when the taxing authorities got the idea that they were somehow exempt from the Administrative Procedure Act. When I first started writing about this stuff, I had more than many, many people say, well, but the Administrative Procedure Act doesn't apply to tax, does it? You know, and, and, and I'm like, where do you people get this idea? Um, you know, and, and one theory, although it is just a theory, is that in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, uh, we had a division of the IRS called Legislation and Regulation, or LNR. Um, and LNR's function was to engage uh, in drafting legislation and drafting regulations, and there was a very high understanding of administrative law doctrine and principles within the LNR division. And then in the 1980s, we reorganized the IRS away from functional lines and towards subject matter lines. And there were good reasons for doing that that had nothing to do with administrative law and everything to do with trying to attract people to come work for the IRS, learn a substantive area of tax law that then they could take back out to private practice. Um, but the LNR division got dispersed across these different subject matter areas. And with that dispersion came sort of a diminishment of some of its expertise and eventually the people left or retired or what have you and we just sort of lost that knowledge. Um, and, and, and it just wasn't, there was so much focus and rightly so on the IRS's core mission of implementing and administering the substance of the tax laws that the procedural stuff just kind of went by the wayside along with around the same time for example the 1986 tax reform act was passed completely reorganizing the internal revenue code and changing all the tax laws and requiring a lot of regulations and needs must as it were you know so that people kind of skimped around a little bit on the procedure to get the guidance out that was really needed and there, there are lots of theories that you can throw out there and it's some combination of all of them I suspect but now we're sort of reaping the consequences of that failure to pay attention to procedure along the way. Okay. Thank you. Well, we are closing this session and thank you for to all the speakers. They were very good. Thank you.
right, well, I have the great pleasure of saying goodbye to you all. Um, and I am amazed that after two very long days, we have this many human beings in the room still sitting here. That's just really fabulous. So before I leave, I, I do just want to thank you all. And I want to thank this panel and all the other panels for being so willing to participate in this conference and, and stepping up. And, some, and so many of you have come up with really good ideas for the next conference. And I've recruited some of you for those ideas. So, you know, but I am very interested in what you have to suggest. And I'm going to give you my email address so, so you can write me and tell me what you suggest. It's Nina, N-I-N-A dot e dot olson o l s o n at irs dot gov nina dot e dot olson at irs dot gov um, i do want to take a minute to thank the wonderful folks who've actually done all the work for this conference um, for wu uh, renee uh, pitsuka and julia mccrory i just you are my hero, and thank you so very much. And then there are the two wonderful human beings from the Taxpayer Advocate Service with whom I could not have, I can't live my life, um, uh, Karen Tober and Mary Claire Ramsey, and I'm just so grateful to them. And then we have, we have, for those of you who were interviewed by our Facebook folks, we have Shannon uh, Moran and Atisha Patel, and I don't think they're here, but apparently, oh, they are, yay to you. And Bob, do you have an update? Do you have an update on numbers, like hits or anything? Sure, I think our first one that we did with you and Woo! So that's great. So, and I want to thank all our sponsors. I want to really thank Tax Analyst and WU for being such great hosts. And then the last thing I just want to say is see you in the Netherlands on May 3rd and 4th of next year. We will get out the, the dates. You know, I mean, we have the dates, but we'll get out the location and everything. And then we will be in Minneapolis with Kristen, and that will be great, too, in 2019. So thank you all.